Good evening and welcome everyone um, to what is the um, second of the recent public lecture series here at Glyndua. Um, for those of you who have not <coughs> caught the, the first, um, which was an excellent um, uh, public lecture by uh, Dr. Cara Gordon about um, Rose West, then that's up online. Um, and this is the second in that series and hopefully we'll have uh, many more to come. So. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, um, I, I struggled actually with the title of what we were going to have today and there was a suggestion that I should try and make it, um, how do you make alcohol policy sexy and I'm not sure you can is the, is the truth of the matter um, and I'm going to give it my best go um, and um, I really wanted to call it the price of the point so somewhere in everything I'm going to talk about today will be something to do with um, what we call minimum unit pricing and the fact that um, price of alcohol can and or does have a specific price and how do we arrive at that. Um, but really I wanted to get towards the end and, and ask this much more interesting question um, about um, can Welsh alcohol policy do any good and hopefully that will uh, come clear about why I want to go down this particular um, journey. So. Um, what I want to uh, do is go on um, a number of journeys uh, in the time and I'm going to try and just take 40-45 minutes and give some time for some questions here. Um, and I think the first of those journeys is the one that I've already said to you which is how come Wales has a minimum unit pricing policy and hopefully it'll become clear to people in a bit and part of that question is why do they not have it in England and how do we arrive at that journey and what does that mean. Um, I think following through from that I want to actually talk a journey about a little bit about Welsh government's overall journey of um, drug and alcohol policy or um, substance use policy as they like to call it. Um, and then somewhere in this I want to talk a journey about how I and or um, some colleagues and particularly Yola who's in the room here have become enmeshed in that particular journey uh, and gone on that way. And I think these are journeys that are unfinished and so this is a really important point and so there is a caveat to, to what I can say at the moment and I'll talk to you about where we are on a journey. Um, but neither the Scottish Government have published their final report and they won't publish a final report on the Scottish implementation of some of this policy stuff until next uh, June, June 2023. Um, and we're not due to make a final report, uh, let alone an interim report to the, to the Welsh Government until the following year. Um, so you'll understand that there are some things that we can't say um, when we're doing bits of research on motion. But I still think I've got a lot of a story that I want to tell you. Um, and that doesn't mean that I can't tell you some of the things that are beginning to appear. And there's plenty of stuff in print and I'm going to talk about that. But in many ways this journey um, needs to begin with um, the thank you. Um, and it needs to be given uh, thank you to a, a number of people and I think uh, partly uh, to just the university uh, and Maria and Simon and, and so on for supporting me to uh, arrive at this position in which, and I do have a slight imposter syndrome, but I'm the person here giving this talk. Um, and um, so, uh, and I'm really grateful for all that support on the journey. I've had a, an amazing 12-year uh, journey so far here uh, at, um, at Glyndur. Um, but I also want to pay particular thank for to two or three colleagues who have worked a lot with um, in this particular area of work and I'll probably come back to a couple of them throughout this talk um, but I particularly want to pay um, tribute to a, a, um, a colleague of mine in Scotland called Andy Perkins who I do an awful lot of work with um, and then a colleague in South Wales called uh, Katie Holloway and two of those people have been instrumental in some of this journey um, but I think the biggest thank you I need to pay in in my ability to even have here and do the public talk with anyone is actually all of the individual uh, drinkers who I've um, lived with, drunk with and or more recently researched and, and spent time with who have just given me their time to tell me their story. Uh, and without listening to those stories I've got n I would have no understanding here. So this in the end is uh, I'm, I'm giving other people's stories back through my own lens. Um, however the starting place for all of these journeys, um, and you may think this is a very strange picture to begin this journey, but um, the starting place for this journey, and um, I thought I'd show you this picture, I, I mean I can flash it for you if you want, but this is the tattoo on my leg. Um, 
And this is a tattoo of a pissed newt <laughs> um, um, holding a bottle of Oban malt whiskey. Um, and I thought I'd just start that by saying, look, actually, alcohol is, at some level, it's become who or what I am. Um, and it, that's happened over 40 odd years um, from some of the most hedonistic drinking through to a process of um, um, running hotels, being a, a licensee, throwing other people out of pubs for being too drunk. Um, to uh, then becoming a social worker, doing several degrees uh, and, and research dissertations around alcohol, to working in drug and alcohol services, to, to living and breathing amongst uh, alcohol and drug orientated recovery communities, and then latterly this final um, um, version of whoever I am an alcohol and being an alcohol researcher as well. So it's really embedded in me, and, and when it was my 50th birthday and um, um, uh, a lady who I've known almost since the day she was born um, offered to give me a, um, a tattoo for my 50th birthday and her tattoos cost hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, she said, what do you want? And it needs to have real meaning. Um, it needs to reflect your life. And so this is where we arrived at. Um, yes. And a bit about Oban and or malt whiskey is we, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but we all have our favourite drugs. Um, and mine probably is a glass of Oban malt whiskey. And that's where my family come from, uh, a few miles south of, uh, uh, south of Oban. Um, but I also wanted to put this image because I'm not unique. And we're talking about alcohol. And alcohol is a drug that's really endemic to our particular society. Uh, and when we then want to consider how we explore or research or evaluate it, then you know, several, of the, uh, the, 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 several of the key books that we would point to as, as researchers or academics um, have titles like Binge Britain or Alcohol, the Nation's Favourite Drug. Yes. Um, so when we begin to explore um, a, 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 trying to make sense of alcohol, we're actually making sense of something that sits in a slightly different position to sometimes when we think about drugs. Yes? But we must also recognize that's only a cultural and historical thing. If we were here 100 years ago, we'd all have been legally entitled to take as much heroin as we wanted. Yes? And if we were in Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't be talking about legalized alcohol. So there is that cultural perspective of it. but. I live and breathe and work here in Wales, England and Scotland and so it, it's, the, it's the drug of our society really um, and it's quite inescapable really. Um, so I just wanted to set some of that scene I think because that's probably really very important. Um, so this talk is going to really be about um, how do we get involved in the business of addressing or perceiving what is associated as the harms from alcohol. And the connection, I think, with that societally embedded nature of alcohol is reflected in images like this. This is, a, this is an image that's been on the internet many, many times. Hands up who's even seen this image before. Yes? So it's not a new image for a number of people, um, and we could put many. And it talks about a vulnerability with alcohol. It talks about an acceptedness of just getting pissed on a Saturday night. It alludes to somehow a society that wants people to drink as much. We even have this peculiar expression of a nighttime economy. And yet at the same time, we uh, and, and some of the people in this room I know have worked with me in spaces where we're supposed to be responsible for managing the nighttime economy and reducing the harms of that space. Um, and there's lots of contradictions in all of that going on, yes? Um, and unpacking that contradiction for us as a society says that actually we want people to drink, but we don't want the harms of the drinking. And the harms of the drinking very often come in two different perspectives. There are perspective of harms to the individual. Yes, and this is a typical example of perhaps where this is an individual who's being harmed, but everyone around her is considered to be OK because they're not being harmed. Um, and then there's the idea that there's a collective harm to society as well. You know, so you can see a lot of other figures that float around in research that says alcohol costs X number of million days a year in lost employment with people who don't turn up to work on a Monday morning because they've had too much of a weekend. Or it costs X amount of money because of the people that present at A&E. You'll see statistics that say in certain A&Es on a, on a Friday or Saturday night, 
everybody who is in that A and E is there because of alcohol. Yes. Yeah. You can see statistics for the area I work in as a qualified social worker that says 90% of all child protection cases involve alcohol or other drugs. So we, we've got this other challenge in society, how do we address, but it's not without this contradiction <laughs> that it's actually something that we also endorse. Yes, and therefore the whole business of a governmental policy response, a researcher's response, a service provider's response, all of that kind of thing, is how do we deal with that contradiction? I'll say a little bit much later on about the fact that I partly think that's a false contradiction. So there are some problems in creating a difference between exploring alcohol separately from drugs at some level, and it's just a falsehood of making one legal and one illegal. Um, and, and there's a lot of argument to say that we should explore them together. Okay, so where does this journey somehow, how do I arrive at this place in which I'm involved with um, uh, Yola and, um, and Andy and Katie and a couple of other colleagues from South Wales, heavily involved at the moment in the evaluation of the minimum unit of pricing in Wales. Uh, I'm heavily involved in, the, in, in some of the stuff in Scotland and I've just come back from a visit in Dublin where I'm doing some work with um, uh, uh, individuals in Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland as well. Um, how do we get on that journey? And, uh, and I think I want to talk partly about two, um, what I would consider to be um, serendipitous moments. And, and the first is that I'm only doing this journey because of something that I've done previously, which I think is very consistent for us as researchers and academics. It doesn't just happen overnight. Um, and this is a very long journey. Um, so the Welsh Government's overall framework for alcohol and um, drug use is, is actually, they call it a substance, it's still called a substance misuse. We've suggested to them that it might want to be called substance use, and there's a lot of arguments about that, and, uh, and one we might want to distinguish between the two. And they have had this strategy from 2008 to 2018, and they're now in a post-strategy period of um, having a policy for 2019 to 2022 in a delivery plan. Um, and although the Welsh Government is drifting from some of these specific strategies as part of its overall approach to well-being and future generations, and hence it's having delivery plans rather than strategies in the future. Um, and somehow, um, before I ever even joined Glyndwr, um, in, in my previous role as working for North Wales Probation Service, I had a brilliant boss, uh, and one or two people will know that boss, a, a gentleman who I owe a lot to called Steve Ray. Um, and uh, he um, had the wisdom or the foresight at some point in time to decide that actually the probation service needed someone who knew something about research and not all of the people to be uh, skilled in MBAs. And he supported me to do my uh, uh, um, PhD. And as part of that process, he said, I think you need to get involved with these group of people. And I got involved with a group of people in an organization I went on to chair. And in that space, I met this gentleman called Andy Perkins. And these are the serendipitous things that happen. And um, these are two conversations. And Andy said, oh, well, maybe we should just work together. OK, great. And you kind of think, well, what happened to that? And then somehow Andy sees a, a, an advertisement to do a review of the Welsh drug and alcohol strategy. And he says, do you fancy coming in with me? Uh, I've got the, back, the background, but I haven't got the Welsh stuff. Anyway, cut long story short, we then set about reviewing the Welsh government drug and alcohol strategy. Um, and that's really uh, what, so that's the strategy cover, and that's the cover of our report. And, uh, and what came out of that was that we actually made a recommendation. We only made three recommendations in our review. Um, Andy and I don't like making recommendations when we review, um, do quite a lot of service evaluation. We make considerations. But we made three recommendations. And one of those is that the Welsh Government should adopt minimum unit pricing. And they need to adopt it quickly before the English Government remove the ability for them to do so. And that was happening through a piece of legislation called the Wales Bill. And the Wales Bill is a Westminster piece of legislation that actually defined which powers could sit in Cardiff and which could see in Westminster. Um, and 
so there we go. Um, and somehow we made the recommendation. They did this, that they were already down that route. It was an easy recommendation for us to make. They were already going to go down that route. And we've ended up evaluating that. The second part of the serendipitous journey, just to, just to get us there, and then I, I can get into the teeth of what we're talking about, was a, a very different sort of one. Um, so I got asked to do my first um, internal, external, internal examination of a PhD student here at Glyndua. Um, and that was a particular, uh, I can see the chair of that particular session smiling, and that was a particularly difficult episode for that student. Um, and um, we had to fail that student. Um, however, the visiting external examiner was Katie Holloway from University of South Wales, and it just so happened, and this is how serendipitous this stuff is, it's luck sometimes. I just happened to be going out of that meeting to a different meeting down in South Wales, which where Katie had come from, and we sat on the, I'd never met her before, and we sat together on the train for three hours, and she said at the end of that conversation, do you know what, I think we should do some work together. So that's how these things happen, there's no magic at some level, sometimes it's just time and place. Um, and so, the rest of this talk is the story about all of those places. So. Coming back to those harms, alcohol policy has this really interesting perspective of what might be considered to be three or four strands. I've not put the fourth strand here. So the fourth strand is something to do with general politics. But in order to develop effective alcohol policy, and some of this cuts across with drug policy, but not quite, um, people talk about the fact that you have to either restrict availability, yes, you have to do something to do with the marketing, and you have to do something with affordability. And you'll begin to realize that price sits in affordability. Yes, and you'll begin to see some of the difficulties of the Welsh journey because actually some of the powers to address availability and marketing aren't devolved here in the way in which they are in other jurisdictions. Um, so that makes it really complicated for the Welsh government to be as effective perhaps as other governments in this particular tight arena. Um, so by availability, we can do all sorts of things. We can um, have um, um, age of sales. We can cut the number of hours that's available to sell alcohol by. We can do all those sort of restrictions. Um, and the marketing stuff is very interesting. Um, um, so we can do things. So if you were to go to Scotland, for example, at the moment, in, and you were to go into a Scottish supermarket, you would not be able to see a bog off for, for, for booze. They have that power, so that's the kind of thing you do. You just remove bog offs and stuff like that. They they ditched happy hours a long time ago. They made those illegal as a as, as an unnecessary marketing uh, and campaign. And then coming to price, there's actually a number of different ways, and this is probably really important to say, there are a number of different ways adopted across the world in which price can then be said to... So, so I should say that the basic premise with price is quite simple. If price is more expensive, consumption at a whole population level, in theory, goes down. And if the overall consumption goes down, the overall harms go down. That's the simple model that people work with. Um, but you can arrive at this price change through three or four different mechanisms. And I'm going to talk to you about um, the um, price per unit, or the green box. But we can arrive through it through taxation, of course, and we're all fully aware of that. Um, and actually we get this annual episode where the Chancellor stands up and waves his red box and everyone cheers when he doesn't put a penny on the price of beer or something like that. So we can, we can go down that route, of course. Uh, that's a potential route. Um, there are countries in the world that make it illegal to sell alcohol below its cost price. So whatever it costs to make it, it's illegal to subsidise it below that, yes? And then you have some countries, for example, who do project-specific. Uh, product specific, and that was what the Russians did. So the Russians just set about increasing dramatically the price of vodka, but said, hey ho Russians, drink whatever else you want, but vodka's causing chaos. So you can do this in some, some very different ways. And the, and the method that's been uh, dominating the conversation here in Wales and Scotland, and I'll go on to talk about in Ireland, is actually minimum unit pricing. So this is, this is the green box. And for those of you who've got the story so far, minimum using pricing is often translated into the frosty jack policy. 
So what we mean by this, this is, an, this is, this is an alcohol that um, can have a very strong um, 7.5. Some of the original Frosty Jack was actually 8.5. This is a more recent picture and a, a change in the market commodity. And you can get three litres of this stuff. At one point in time, you could buy a three litre bottle for not very much money. Um, and in terms of what's going on in a three litre bottle of Frosty Jack, it's almost the equivalent of a bottle of whiskey in terms of units, and you could buy it for three quid. A tenner a day could get you two and a half bottles of whiskey a day. You can begin to see how the policy makers <laughs> want to think about what they can do about that, and why the MUP price is known as a Frosty Jack policy, and what MUP is, of course, is that MUP is you set this price, which is 50p, so that's the price element. It's via the unit of alcohol, um, not everyone gets to calculate units of alcohol. I'm sure some of you do and some of you can't, and some of you just read the label on the back to go how many units. But it's a straightforward kind of, uh, you measure the volume of the bottle by the, the APB, and it tells you how many units are in it, and then you times it by the 50p, and that tells you the minimum price that you can sell it at. So this stuff suddenly goes from being able to be sold at three, three pound, it's got 22 units in it, and suddenly it becomes 11 quid a bottle. And one of the things we know about uh, minimum pricing already is, and, and I'll paraphrase it in some street language, but no self-respecting drunk is going to actually drink Frosty Jack if actually the vodka is the same price to some degree or another. They only drink this stuff because it was so cheap in the first place. Yes? You know, so that's the kind of thing. Um, uh, it's a bit flippant because for one or two people it's actually their drug of choice still. <laughs> and they still try and seek it out no matter what it costs. So, um, Kind of what happened, uh, what went on here. Um, so in terms of Wales, and then I'll set the slightly bigger context for Scotland and everything else, but in terms of Wales, uh, the Welsh Government, um, they were under pressure, um, so they introduced a um, policy that said it was 50p a unit. That was introduced, that was very successfully introduced without any problem whatsoever. Um, quite quiet. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about compliance uh, and that's been absolutely fine. Um, the law came in quite quickly. However, here in Wales, and one of the really important things to understand was rapidly, this was introduced on March the 2nd, 2020. And on March the 20th, I think, in 2020, what happened? We went to lockdown, yes? <laughs> so we had a massive spanner thrown in, in, in the work of the two-year journey here. And, and I did a, an analysis in the newspapers of news stories about MUP in Wales. Uh, and, and for the first 18 days, the first uh, eight days or something, 10 days, there was lots and lots of coverage. By March the 20th, no one was talking about it in Wales, yes? You know, and these other images were the things that we saw um, uh, 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 lots of the time, yes? Okay? But we can say some things happen straight away. This is not me prejudicing any of the research. This, this, this stuff is already out in the ether. Um, the products did change. We could go in the shop and see them change overnight. The prices became 50p. As some of you may have even seen the notices in the supermarket saying that this was what was going on. And for those of you who live in this part of Wrexham, you will already know that that's an active and, 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 and enduring policy. Or those of you who live in England, because you'll know that your booze is cheaper in an English supermarket than it is in a Welsh supermarket and vice versa. So we know that MUP has come in and we know that the prices have, have been impacted. What we can't say so much about is, and we'll talk a little bit more about as I go on, about what's actually happened. Yes? But the Welsh Government have done this. Um, and... Uh, um, what became interesting um, was that um, the Welsh Government then put out, um, well, they went through this interesting process. When they were drafting the bill, um, they invited a couple of people to um, um, just uh, contribute to the process, and um, they paid Andy and I to do a very small piece of work, and that very small piece of work said, what size of evaluation do we need to do in Wales? Um, can we actually just use the Scottish evaluation? And I'll say something more about Scottish evaluation in a second. And we kind of said to them, well, you can't, because the data is completely different, and if you want to do it statistically, there's no comparison whatsoever. But broadly speaking, 
the nature of drinkers and countries is not that widely diverse. And as long as you do a small number of evaluations and or you check that some of the same things are going on in Wales that have previously gone on in Scotland, you can trust some of the Scottish evidence about how MUP does or doesn't work. Um, and so they decided to have... Um, um, during the draft bill, they had um, concern from um, Welsh MPs that the, the one thing that this was going to do was going to turn all the alcohol drinkers into heroin users, because heroin would be much cheaper than alcohol. And that was their big fear. And they put out a tender to do that particular piece of work. And Yola, myself, and Katie and Andy won that particular tender. And we did the first piece of evaluation on some of the predictive behavior on MUP in Wales. And then they put out a tender for four pieces of evaluation of the policy. And we also put in for three out of four of those pieces of evaluation. And we were successful for those, really. And maybe because we had become, by then, the only players inside Wales doing MUP stuff. And maybe we became the natural or or the only fit. Um, sometimes, and it's been even more acute for my colleagues in Sheffield, it feels a little bit like sometimes you're marking your own homework, if that makes sense. There's a little bit of that experience going on. So there we go. Um, but we talked a lot about them um, having to learn something from Scotland. And I, you don't need to look at any of this detail. You just need to know that I've just told you that there are four evaluations in Wales. Yes, Scotland have you can see the figure 15 and the figure 7, they have 22 evaluations. I've just got off a, a, a been in a meeting today where um, all of those kind of folk in, in, in Scotland who are doing some form of evaluation and meeting with the government, the government have four or five dedicated staff in an alcohol evaluation team alone. Yes, they've um, got, uh, they commissioned 17 studies, they've got the they've 15 studies, they've got these other six or seven studies. The amount of evaluation going on in Scotland is huge. Yes, and that's partly because Scotland were first. And for those of you who know the story in Scotland, the Scottish government was dragged through the court for five years with the price contested by the alcohol industry. It took them five years to get their policy in implemented because of being dragged through the court for five years. And part of that experience really led them to want to make sure the evaluation was absolutely robust. And the Scottish minimum unit pricing adopted what was known as a sunset clause. Yeah. So they've only so sunset clause legislation is very unusual and we don't have too much of it. So what a sunset clause piece of legislation says you means you put the legislation on the books for a certain period of time and the government has to actively renew it. And if they don't renew it, it just disappears off like the sunset. So the Scottish government have got to get enough evidence to go back to the Scottish Parliament and say, can we carry on with this policy? The Welsh Government are in a similar sort of framework. Um, so, anyway, so I, I guess we, you, you, you want to hear from me, well, what's going on? Um, and I've said to you there's a limit to what can be said, but there's actually quite a lot that can be said. Um, so from a, a, a Welsh point of view, and, and as a team, we've now published three different papers on, or reports on this, and one journal paper on this. I think of the Scottish evaluations, I think maybe as many of about 15 or 16 are now in the public domain. There's a number of journal articles in the public domain. So while I, no one can tell you what's happening at the end of the journey, it's possible now, because stuff is in the public domain, for me to tell you some of what's beginning to emerge in the story about minimum unit pricing. And I can do that from a slightly more limited Welsh perspective. Um, and I can do it from a much bigger Welsh perspective after we've given them their interim report and they've published it later this year. But I can't. Uh, um, but we can do quite a lot also based on the Scottish perspective. Um, and it's an interesting journey, really. Um, we have a number of key messages. Um, and those key messages are pretty straightforward. So the first thing I said to you, and this stuff has been published, um, and it's been evident for anyone, it's evident for you to go in the supermarket today. I don't know if anyone's been in the supermarket today and realised that actually um, vodka uh, and gin is being sold at the bottom end price at £10.13. I don't know if anyone's noticed that. This is an unnatural behaviour of the supermarkets and the industry. They would sell you this at 9 99 10 49 10 99 
they're only selling it at 10 pound and 13 pence because that's the lowest price the law allows them to sell you it at yes so we've got lots of evidence in all sorts of places that compliance with the law is really really high in fact, the stories in Wales so far, and there was just one story down in South Wales um, where public, uh, where trading standards had actually in, enforced a penalty notice on two or three shopkeepers. Uh, it's actually really, really rare. So that's one other thing. So actually, they just get on with it. One of the reasons they get on with it, most of it's sold through a, um, a system whereby their head offices just sort it out. And, and tell them what the price is and they get it sorted. What surprised me was that they actually did it straight away for, uh, you know, so Morrisons in England can work it out for Morrisons in Scotland and work it out for Morrisons in Wales and they don't seem to, to make the mistake of getting the, the wrong pricing tickets going to one Morrisons or the other. So, so, so we know that's going on. The other thing we know because it's uh, there for us to go and see in the shops, but we also know that some of it's now been reported on, of course, is that the prices of some products changed. They were really obvious which ones they were. They were particularly the cheap ciders became really expensive. Um, um, some wine, um, which was being sold at 3.49, suddenly became 4.19, 4.20. And we know following that there was a little bit of product change and product withdrawal. So this policy also does that. Some products disappear because it's no longer worth anyone selling them. Yes and or you get some slight change. So some suggestion that maybe bottle size changes slightly or APBV changes or something, just to help this price promotion. And one of the things we saw, for example, in the shops, um, um, evident to anyone, um, pretty much straight after MUP, for example, was the rise in 50 centilitre spirit bottles. Because a 50 centilitre spirit bottle, when you convert it, can be sold for 9.99, which means someone can still get a hit for a tenner. This is an important psychological process. So, so, so we know all that sort of stuff happened, yes? Um, we know in Scotland, because they published the data for the first year, that overall consumption in Scotland went down. And then when they used the control group in England, where consumption went up, it becomes an even bigger de facto consumption went down in Scotland. So we know that's, that it's been published as well, that actually the broad principle that says that if you increase that price, then there will be some change in consumption. Um, what it's a little harder for me to say at this point in time and what will come out of the research and what will arrive at the end is, what does this mean for specific populations? Yes? What does this mean for some of the other harms? And what does this mean for some of the alternative behaviours? Um, and I think we'll begin to hear some of that evidence as it unfolds. Um, um, so we're in the middle of a journey, and um, uh, really this public talk was to help people begin to understand how and why and what's going on in the supermarket out there. Uh, and we are clearly seeing a policy that is capable of having a quite dramatic effect overnight um, in, in certain visible spaces. Um, but the more nuanced evaluation takes some time to arrive at. Um, and that involves some very complicated stuff. Um, um, a bit of a headache that Yola and I have to, to wade through at some point in time. I'm not sure how we're going to make, make uh, sort of all of that mess. And of course, we must remember that even for the harms, price isn't the only contributing factor. So you could just have a policy that reduces the price and reduces the consumption, and or you still get more admissions at A&E. You get more homelessness. There can be other factors that contribute. Yes. Um, and uh, we've been trying to develop our understanding of a quite nebulous research methodology associated with either contribution analysis, sometimes called realist evaluation, that's supposed to enable us to uh, both research the concrete stuff that's happening and then maybe the stuff that doesn't happen and, and, and try and uh, come up with some explanations. And I think we're right in saying, aren't we, y'all, that's a bit of a black box game, yes? <laughs> we're not 100% sure what anyone does in that game, yes? Um, OK. Um, I think um, what we can say from both of those pictures, of course, is, is two really obvious statements, really. So these are my crude diagrams, and I've presented these at a couple of conferences just because I quite like them, really. Um, um, uh, uh, um, and, and, you know, so I could do traditional scientific diagrams, but I'm a qualitative researcher, so you know, this is this is 
pure science as, as I do it, you know. Um, and, and we've got, a, in this particular diagram here, we've got a standard kind of reducing the harms against the time uh, with a price mapped on it. And what we know is, of course, that even if we have some impact of a 50p, if we don't do anything with that 50p, this is obviously just for pricing alone, it's going to be price policy dependent. Not exclusively, and we'll come back to incomes later. Um, and if we do nothing with it, then the effect is going to tail off because that alcohol is going to become relatively cheaper. Yes? So one of the things that politicians have got to struggle with is what moment you decide to increase the price. And good luck for any politician at the moment, yes, suggesting in the time of, you know, two pound a litre petrol and, you know, three thousand pound a year fuel bills that you're going to go and increase the price of people's pint, yes? Good luck to them, yes? But we know if we don't do anything about it, then the effect is moderated. And there is a suggestion that if you take the 50p price, which you heard me tell you the Scottish story, which comes from a model that was devised in 2007 and 2008, was at best a 2012 price, probably today ought to be 65p to get the effect of the modelling. So already whatever effects we end up evaluating will be less than the intended modules and will reflect the price that's set, yes? And then obviously there are other factors that can contribute to this, like inflation and or widening inequalities. The other thing we know is that once we try to look at something so complex on the picture I've already told you, uh, this idea about where might we actually be able to say this is the effect of MUP and then this is the effect of everything else. The longer we go on, the more muddier that water gets. Yes? Um, you know, um, although some people are arguing that COVID is not necessarily in muddy water because maybe COVID has happened in England as well and England don't have this policy and we can still use England as a control example. But essentially what I think is going on um, is for us it's a mixture of a Pandora's box and a dog's breakfast and we're going to spend quite a lot of time over the next uh, year and a half fertling around in this mess and try and make some sense and I think we will make some sense and I think you know the basic premise that price affects consumption um, and probably is fairly straightforward and you know what's going to be more difficult is to say to exactly what extent to which set of people in which acute circumstances and under what price and I think that's the difficult part of that journey. But I did have two halves to this presentation, so that's the story of MUP. And, and the other half of this presentation was really just to ask the question, well, is this doing any good? Is it a good thing? Can the Welsh Government do any good things about alcohol and stuff? And I, I just wanted to ask some other questions about that, really, of course. Um, and the first thing, of course, is just to say that the, the other factors like COVID and cost of living and, and, and so on and so forth, if they make things very difficult. Even something as simple as moving to universal credit makes it different. You know, people on benefits and or drinkers will behave differently with a month's money in their pocket to what happens when you receive it every week. So, you know, even small things like that can affect drinking behaviour. So there's lots and lots of complicated things to, to consider here. The Welsh Government, more broadly, has positioned its mouth to a long-term future generations, health promotion, health improvement, preventative type approach. The Welsh Government is also not unopposed to state intervention, and it's not committed to the and I would say, and I'm very political, um, the crazy, unfair and unjust neoliberalistic capitalist model that comes out of Westminster. So they are clearly committed to a slightly different approach. I would argue a healthy one. Yes. But their journey in arriving at this and the ability of how much impact they can have is an interesting one. We are only a partially devolved so even when we want to look at MUP comparison between Scotland and Wales, the Welsh Government have had less powers. They were rushed into it, as I said before. Um, so I often think, oops, Daisy, I often think this is a tale of two bills. Um, and it's a tale of two bills twice, really. I, I think first the Welsh bill, the Wales bill, um, so this one that the, went through to Westminster to determine the powers, meant that, uh, that it was almost all the Welsh Government could do at that point in time. 
They didn't have command of the other things. Um, and they had to do it there and then quite quickly in the end because the English government were going to remove the powers from them in the settlement to be able to do this at all. And then it would have just stayed with Westminster. Um, and so they have an exclusively a minimum price for alcohol bill. Now in Scotland and Ireland have now joined in the party. So Ireland had minimum unit pricing from um, January 2002. 22 this January. They have it at a higher price than both Scotland and Wales. Um, both Scotland and Wales were able to introduce something that's referred to as an alcohol health bill. And they were able to incorporate other things associated. If you remember all the way back to my diagram, they were able to put availability and marketing considerations in. So clearly there's a limit to what minimum unit price is going to do compared to those countries. Yes? Um, and of course, you don't need to tell me why we arrive at that, you know, and, and that's the difference between some of these chambers and, and, and perspectives. Um, so there are some limits of Welsh, Welsh devolution in this area. However, we should be really positive at some other level about what the Welsh Government can or cannot do, because more generally, health and social care, a bit like education, is at least reasonably devolved. Where it gets complicated for alcohol harms particularly is that the criminal justice element of it is less devolved. The Home Office have a massive footprint still in Wales. And they don't have the same footprint in Scotland, for example, or in Ireland. You know, so Pretty Portrayal still wields an axe here in Wales, um, and to a lesser extent in, you know, so on and so forth. So that's an important consideration. So, why does, it, why does it mean it's slightly limited? Well, I, I just want to show you this picture here. So I told you I'd just recently been to Dublin. Yes, so one of the things they've done in Dublin is they've actually demarcated the alcohol sales area inside supermarkets. So if you're in Ireland now, you have to go through a barrier like this to even access the alcohol. Similar to what happens in Australia, if any of you have been to Australia, or places like Sweden where the hard alcohol is in a different space to the supermarket, stuff like that. And that clearly affects who can just wander in and out. Um, these have big notices in Ireland, no 18-year-olds, and you know, it's much harder and conspicuous to go in there and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So it might only have a small effect or a small nudge effect, but it, but it, has, but it has some, yes? And I've suggested to you they don't have bog offs, they don't have happy hours and stuff. So there's, a, there's just a limit in the alcohol policy legislation stuff that's available to the, to, to the, um, to the government. So do I think it's a good thing? Um, will it do any good? Well, it, clearly the, one of the catalysts for arriving at this was that alcohol was being sold four Christmases ago in supermarkets cheaper than bottled water. And no one can suggest to me that's a good thing. Yes, so at one level, this app policy can probably do no harm. It's probably not going to do significant harm until it becomes a pound a unit or something like that. And then we'll be evaluating whether or not the harms to certain client groups outweigh the overall population reduction in consumption because alcohol becomes so expensive. But we're not in that game when it's 50p. Um, Yes, I think the Welsh Government can do uh, a lot of good with their alcohol policy because they talk to and work with the people that provide services and or they work with health. And it's a smaller country. We've got a much more joined up conversation. There's a, there's a government will, yes, to actually do some good here. So uh, there's, there's loads of potential despite the limitations of, uh, of, of, of devolution. So, so I think all of that is, is, is totally possible. Um, however, I'm also a social justice, radical orientated social worker, and I'm not convinced that we're actually tackling the right problem here. Yes? Um, I'm probably a libertarian. I'm probably in favour of legalisation of all drugs, for example. Yes? So, for me, this is a much more complicated conversation than perhaps just saying, can the alcohol policy do any good? I'm almost asking the question, do we really need an alcohol policy? Are we actually after the wrong thing at one level? It's a bit like shooting myself in the foot because I'm suggesting I don't really want to be doing the thing I'm doing and, you know, why am I earning a living off something that might not be so good? And I've got a couple of um, thoughts or explanations behind this. So this is something that I published quite a long time ago. Um, 
you're familiar to one or two people, I know one or two people from local drug services know that local drug services use this model sometimes in some of their um, relapse prevention groups and stuff like that. And this is something I published which is referred to essentially as my crap model, yes? Okay. Um, and, and really it wants to say in the bottom line of things, for many of the people that are experiencing difficulty with drink or drugs, drink or drugs are not the problem. They're actually the solution. They're the way in which people cope with very difficult experiences in life. Yes? And if all you do, and this is what this simple model says, is all you do, and, and what the alcohol and the drug use does, is double the problems in life. It doesn't solve the original problems. And therefore, of course, if all you do is take away the alcohol without providing any other support, addressing any of the other underlying issues, then all you're going to do is reduce we're just going to have half the crap. That's the best you can get from a policy if that's all you do. Yes? So in order to reduce this stuff, we actually have to address other f issues. And for me, those big issues, I've, for some people, they still remain within the individual. Um, but for me, these are mostly about social and family and, and em environmental issues, social justice issues. So one of the things that's said about MUP is, well, MUP is clearly an unfair policy because it affects the poor. They're the ones that drink cheap alcohol. And when I first thought about that, I thought, well, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not fair. Um, this is just some middle class policy. And then I actually thought, no, the problem for the poor is not the price of MUP. It's poverty. Yes? <laughs> you know, you know, let's not worry about the fact that this policy is affecting, you know, when people can't pay their bills, they can't get the food bank, they don't go on holidays like other people, they don't own their house, you know, they don't get to, you know, it, there's a bigger issue here. And it's some of those things that want addressing. So we can do an alcohol policy and will it do any good? And I think one of the things I'm saying is it perhaps it won't do if we don't address issues of inequality, social justice, poor environments, poverty, all of these kind of issues. And again, the question then has to be asked, how much influence does the Welsh government have over those, as opposed to Westminster, and or the world that we live in at the moment that is one of globalized economics. Okay, my last couple of points here then. One of the other things we have to consider, of course, is this issue about where does the drug sit? So one of the most famous papers that floats around is one that David Nutt did for The Lancet. And at the time, David Nutt was the Westminster government's advisor on drug misuse. And he was asked to do a paper, and he convened a whole set of experts. And these experts all went in a room and crunched all sorts of stuff. And they produced a model of which drugs cause the most harm. Yes, and they reported back to the government and said the most harmful drug is alcohol. Does anyone know what happened to David Nutt after he produced this report? He was forced to resign. He was forced to resign. He was, yeah, and we're not having that sort of specialist advisor and the report gets buried and we ignore that particular piece of advice. So one of the other problems we've got is if we just have a focus on alcohol policy or separate it, we're also not asking the questions about which harms do we concern ourselves with. And actually, we've got this slightly big society view that says, actually, we tolerate the harms of alcohol because of the other perspectives. Yes. So there is a whole question about our legal framework associated with drugs that might want to change. Yep. OK, so two other bits. I said before that I think this is an issue of poverty. Um, and um, uh, what really is required is some kind of radical change. Um, and can an alcohol policy do some good? Yes, it can, but I might ultimately advocate for a slightly different alcohol policy than the one that I work with. Um, and I think I'm a little bit like um, the story of the tourist that gets lost in Southwest Ireland. And they go up to the farmer and say, can you tell me how to get to X? To which the farmer says, of course, well, I wouldn't start from here. And I think one of the problems that we've got is we keep trying to stick sticking plasters, and maybe we just need to take a whole step back. Yes? And part of that might be about alcohol, is then having a more realistic and open conversation about 
what is the role of alcohol in our society, yes? Okay, what's the entitlement for anyone to have drugs or not have drugs, to be supporting an environment which, in which they don't need to lean to them as coping mechanisms, treat them perhaps in the role that they've always sat, which is either as social lubricants or creative hedonistic pleasures, yes? But not as coping mechanisms to ensure that we can survive the wage slave structure of the neoliberalist capitalist society. So we've got to think about all of that sort of change. And then, um, and I've got some, you know, um, some good friends in the room from the recovery community here. Um, we also hear from lots and lots of people that actually, at some level, the getting off of alcohol or drugs is the easier part of the equation. And the difficult part is staying off. And staying off is therefore not about addressing the alcohol issue. And the recovery stuff is about people's lives. And we've got this contradiction right the way across policy, where we often talk about prevention. Um, and we have lots of different pieces of legislation that say we should have prevention. And then we tuck in the legislation the things that local authorities, health authorities, and peoples must do. Um, and we have an understanding that this is you know, that this particular issue, so in terms of alcohol getting off is 10% of the journey and 90% of that journey happens afterwards. Um, you know, uh, the way to avoid people being in child protection is to invest in them up front. Um, but we never spend the money that way round. So we have 90% of public spending very often concentrated in what we might call the acute the traumatic, the hospital, the psychiatry, the um, the child protection based, in police running around doing the crime, and, and we don't have enough of the resources spent in the preventative agenda. And then we don't have enough of the resources spent when we have managed to get people supported to a place in which they're back on their feet again, spent in a way in which we enable them to then sustain that journey. We often just chuck them back into the same milieu and then get surprised when they come back through the door, you know, two months later and they're fallen off the wagon, to use an expression, and they're back at it. Well, kale okay, surprise. Get me off the drugs, send me back to the bed sit. I'm in the four walls, I've got no job, I've got no opportunities, and all I've got is Jeremy Kyle. Well, I'm for one, I'm taking drugs if Jeremy Kyle is all I've got. Yes? It's a natural response. So we have to think about all of that stuff. So there you go, I've taken you on a journey of what I consider to be um, they're the complexity of trying to address some of the issues of what is the nation's favourite drug. Um, and it's made even more complicated by the fact that it remains my favourite drug. So I chose very deliberately when I qualified as a social worker to give up illegal drugs. I didn't want to engage in the contradiction of being a qualified and registered social worker who then happened to get stopped by the Rosas for some uh, a wee bit of cannabis in my pocket or whatever else yeah? so you know it's just like I made that decision but I also made that decision because alcohol is my favorite drug um, so there you go I've told you a story of me and my world and our world and something about alcohol thank you very much Thank you very much. On a really, really um, interesting and so important uh, piece of work that you're doing. And um, it, it has been a journey, and it certainly has been a journey for you within the university as well. It has indeed, yeah. And of course, we should all congratulate Wolf on, his, uh, on the recent news that Wolf is now a professor. He's a member of the ranks of our professors at the university. Thank you very much. And I'm still feeling a bit of a fraud, but thank you. <laughs> this really complicated um, and nebulous methodology of uh, contrib contribution analysis. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Because I remember reading the REF um, submission and trying to fathom what that meant. <laughs> but I think we got it, we must have got there in the end because it got a really good review. Um, yeah, I think, we're doing okay. I think we're doing okay, yeah, I think. Well, <laughs> I think we, we are. And, and we've got three star, four star, and lots of stars. So, Thank you. Uh, so well done for that as well. And um, there's still a long way to go, so yeah, yeah. plenty more uh, work to do, um, but this isn't about the publication, this is about the value of that work, because this, this is really valuable. Mm -hmm. for us.
So I'm sure people will have questions. So I'll open. Yeah, any questions on anything? The whole lot. No, on anything. In relation to them. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I ask one question? Um, thank you for the talk. I think it's been very interesting, fascinating. Uh, though I was a bit disturbed about the image you painted of Pretty Patel with an axe, <laughs> which was indeed very disturbing. Um, one of the questions that I've always had with minimum pricing is that by setting minimum price, you're setting a uh, certain amount of profit for the company selling yeah. the item, would it be far preferable to um, enforce that through taxation yeah, rather so than the minimum I, It's a great question um, um, and it's a question that gets asked when you do this research stuff. Um, you know, very typically people ask you where does the money go? And when we explain to them that the money doesn't do anything else, as you've just rightly described, then already happens. In other words, a, a bit goes to the treasury each time you increase it. But yes, the, the retailers get their profit. And of course, that's always the biggest mystery in this as well. Why did the industry challenge a price when the price going up would only give them more profit um, uh, and so on and so forth? So, so um, that is something that people absolutely raise as a question. Um, I think the counter argument raised at the moment is that yes, that would be great if we thought that taxation arrived at doing the thing that it ought to do, which is actually then come back and invest in people, health, NHS. So I think there's a difficulty at the moment. I, I would agree with you if you thought that the taxation system was actually going to do the thing it was due, but if you're going to spend it four, mil, four billion on burning PPE equipment, you're going to spend it on, you know, um, for all we know that the alcohol taxation would then just result in dropping a load of bombs somewhere else in the world. So I think it's that dilemma. Yeah. And, and then we've got the added level of complexity here, and particularly for the Welsh Government, how would they get their share of the money that goes back to the Treasury? Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's, that, that's a particular complexity within the UK. Um, and, and you know the Irish have a slightly different perspective because you know so that's so it's got those layers of complexities, um, but yes, it, you know, and I think that's why some people think taxation. The modellers, as I understand it, and it's not my area, say that pricing is slightly more effective in terms of consumption than taxation. But with the diminishing return, if if, if it doesn't track inflation. Yes. Absolutely, um, and I, I, I wouldn't want to be in, 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 in someone's position, as I said a moment in the speaker, I wouldn't want to be the one that's got to suggest, actually, we need to raise this price at the moment. Um, so I think you're absolutely right at one level, um, but it's particularly, uh, for the Welsh Government, it would just be giving more money, to, in theory, potentially to Westminster that never made its way back to Cardiff. So, you know, and, and I suspect the Westminster Government, to be fair, would dispute you know, they often argue that Scotland and Wales gets more of the taxation per head of population than the English population. So. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, I was just thinking, with this minimum pricing of alcohol being such a complex issue, what other factors that you have either analysed or have just come up with something unforeseen and unpredictable? So I can only say that for Scotland, not for Wales at this point in time, sorry. But for Scotland and particularly even for Wales from sort of initial data that you've seen, have there been other factors that have been in market pricing, such as maybe from a negative point of view, maybe crime going up for people to yep. pay this extra price for the alcohol? Yep. Yeah, these are really good questions. So w when we have the overall evaluation model, whether it's the one that the Scottish Government are, are developing or whether it's the one that we do, it has to consider oh, all of 
all of those factors. Um, we've got a draft structure for our interim report that starts with what's out there in the literature and the model review was already established. It follows with a chapter based on what's known in Scotland. It's then based on what happened in the four Welsh studies. It's then based in what's available in Welsh data sets, of course. So we're then looking at both crime data, hospital data, you know, anything that Public Health Wales have got. And we have to consider all of those factors into the equation. Um, and then we are doing qualitative interviews across all of the projects. We're actually just going and asking people as well, because that's equally as important. And, and, and what's required here is some synthesis of all that material to, to suggest something. Um, and, and the problem is that it's actually quite difficult. Um, and, and just for example, to give you COVID as an example, we know in the first 12 months following COVID, because this is information that's well known, that overall consumption in the UK went down significantly between the periods of, so the counting year would be April 2020 to March 2021, and no amount, if there was an increase in home drinking, can compensate for the periods when the pubs are closed, for example. So you've got to get with all of those complexities. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and the fear for the Welsh Government, as I alluded to, was this negative stuff you talked about. So their biggest fear was that people would switch, but the other biggest fear that's offered, uh, so switch usually to, you know, to, to illegal drugs, um, but the other big fear is absolutely what you've talked about in terms, of, in terms of crime. I think the nuanced fear that really wants to get explored actually is what's the financial impact on families. You know, that, that might be the, the more nuanced harm in the end. Yes, what actually happens in those household incomes that are squeezed potentially. So yeah, it's a, it's a really important point and yeah, we have to try and make as much sense of it as we can. Um, I don't think anyone's going to prove causality in this, so I think, you know, I think it's obviously too complicated for that. Yes? Senior? Is there any evidence, and we're very close to the English-Welsh border here, is there any evidence that people are choosing to shop in England? Okay, so yeah, this is one of the minor parts, this is one of the minor parts of the story in a way. I know, it's a very... It's, a, it's an interesting part of the story, it's a minor part of the story, so let me just start with Scotland, and, and then we'll come back to, to, to Wales. Um, so the, the standard evaluation method, just to come back to the previous question, of course, is to try and do this as a natural experiment to say that in Scotland, England and Wales didn't have minimum pricing. So as long as we just compare those two things, then the only variant is minimum pricing. It gets more complicated for us in Wales to say that the only variant, but we should still be able to compare to England. Um, and part of that is then examining what's going on in England with Wales, also with these cross-border sales. Um, and on a data sets that are available to us, we can't establish that. The data sale is so insignificant. So the data set geographical areas give you things like the whole of the northwest of England or something like that. You know, so we're talking about can we find the cross-border sales amongst the data that's actually for all of those people in Birmingham that are coming nowhere near our border potentially or Manchester that are all going to supermarket. So it's really hard to extract that. So the only way we're really getting to evaluate cross-border shopping, both in the north and in, uh, in Scotland and here, is the qualitative element. We're asking people, what are we hearing? Yes. And the answer to that is that in the broadest sense of the word, yes, it takes place for some where it can. You know, and we can expect to see three types of cross-border shopping. You know, number one is for people who are just naturally crossing the border because it's their daily journey. And if you're working or commuting across those boundaries and you've got both a footprint in England and Wales and you're aware of this stuff, then people will make the conscious choice just to buy it in England because it's cheaper. Yes? Yeah? then some people will be going to England for certain events and then, you know, and stuff like that. But statistically, for a policy that's about overall societal consumption, it's, it's a drop in the ocean, if that makes sense. So, so we're, we will be able to evidence, I'm sure people evidence that it happens, but from the bigger policy picture, it's, you know, and that the concern might be um, more about um, and the Welsh Government have commissioned a specific small retailers report and they are very interested on the impact on Welsh border retailers. So that might be the biggest harm in all of that journey. 
is, you know, if someone's in Wales and there's a, a, an off licence a mile down the road across the border, has that made their business go bankrupt? You know, and in Scotland we heard of one off licence really close to the border. Wales has got a different border, so this area particularly has obviously got a very different border to Scotland. The Scottish border is a bit peculiar to get its head round. There's a little bit where people might go to Carlisle. And there's a tiny bit up where Berwick, but it's not got the same massive, you know, this particular northeast area has got that fluidity. Um, and Yola and I are keen to continue to develop um, using it as a pilot area just to understand if there's an extra level of nuance in our evaluation. But from an overall policy, drop in the ocean. There was one more, one more question. Yeah, I was wondering, um, I really enjoyed the talk, by the way. I'm quite fascinated by the topic of addiction and alcohol, and I was curious about if you've come across someone called Johan Harry. Yes. His uh, project that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Yes. And I, and I was curious if, you, if that had influenced any of your research or your thinking, and also um, if, if you're saying the solution is much bigger, discounting the whole kind of, you know, dis dismantling the juggernaut of late stage capitalism as a solution, would you focus on more community based uh, things as a solution based on that? So I guess I can answer that question pretty straightforward, really. It's not affected my research at all um, in the sense that I don't research in that realm. It absolutely affects my practice as a qualified and registered social worker um, and the work that I do um, um, and the community that I choose to do my work with. And I've got some very good friends in here, Tony and Lucas stuff. Um, I choose to practice and or support and work and live with recovery communities. So yeah, I'm absolutely into that. I don't do research in that area. Um, um, and I don't very often write about it. When I do write about it, it's in, in, or, or speak about it, it's unusual places. And partly because that kind of research is so difficult to fund. If you're going to believe in the recovery model and they're going to believe in the value of connection and you're going to believe in peer-led stuff, then the option available to you is to do what's known as participant-based research. Yes? So in other words, actually the research has got to come from the recovery community first. It can't be led by me as an expert. Um, so it, it's a much more complicated stuff to get to. And finally, I have made the odd application for research funding to do participation, action research, and very often in the evaluation of research bids, because you're suggesting a project in which you are not the expert, you don't know the journey you're going to go on, that journey is going to be determined by the, the drink or drug users or those in recovery you're working with, it gets rejected as a research bid because it's not clear what you're going to do, even though that's what the method is. So it's very hard to get research bids in the same way for participatory research than it is for evaluation, clinical trials, and so on and so forth. So a simple answer, no, I, I, I keep it in another space because I probably wouldn't have gotten the journey and my bosses wouldn't be very happy with me because I'd have got no money and no research projects and no papers, but there we go. Yeah, something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I love that stuff. That Gabor Mate, do you know Gabor Mate? Yeah, great stuff, yes. Bruce Alexander, these, these, are, these are my academic heroes in, in those models, yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I think you've had some great questions and, 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 and clearly your talk has uh, struck the right chord. Uh, Thank you. Really interesting topic, and uh, we're going to draw to a close now. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, yeah, thank you ever so much, everyone. Please, thank you. Yes. And thank you all for, for a fantastic talk. It's all being recorded, so we'll be able to watch it back. Um, we'll be able to draw people's attention to it. And, thank you. Um, not least of all, uh, UK are right, and uh, who knows? Maybe one day it'll wake up and say, "Yeah, this is really the way to, to do it." In qualitative research, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and that level of uncertainty actually should be ex accepted yeah. by funding bodies for research. I think so. They might see the lights one day. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Enjoy the rest of the evening.